It's no secret that I love server components. The new React model has taken a bit to click in my head, but once it did, I couldn't go back. That hasn't stopped us from constantly debating whether or not they're actually ready for production though. And I wanna have this conversation as sincerely as I can. Yes, Vercel does sponsor the channel, but they're not sponsoring this video. And I don't know how much they'll even agree with my stances. So please ignore that part as much as you can with this. Obviously, Take everything I say with a grain of salt, but do that with everybody you're listening to opinions about this from. Before we can talk about whether or not server components are ready, we have to define two things. The first is production ready, and the second is server components. Production ready means a different thing to almost everybody. For some people, production ready means that it's stable, has been marked as 1.0, and nothing's ever going to change about it. For other people, production ready means the behaviors are reliable and will always behave the way that they are right now. For some people, production ready just means it's not going to crash and it solves the problem they have in production. I like to think of production ready as solving a problem reliably for a set or subset of developers. And for me, server components absolutely meet that definition. I've had a great experience shipping server components since way back in March of this year. We've been shipping them for upload thing from day one, and it's been an incredible experience. Yes, there are bugs with server components, but I don't find those bugs in production. I find them when I'm writing the actual code. And in that sense, I've actually had a much better experience with server components than with React before, because we'd have stuff like a use effect that works totally fine in dev, seems totally fine for a while, and then suddenly is causing all sorts of issues. Before we go any further with the definition of production ready though, I want to draw some lines around server components themselves, because it is a term that includes a lot in it. The issue I run into a lot is that most of the time when people say server components, they're not just talking about a React component that exclusively runs on server. This is what a server component is. However, server components have a lot of other things that we associate with them and do with them. We will usually think of when they hear server component. So by definition, a server component itself is a React component that only runs on the server such that it can send HTML-like syntax directly from server to client for it to render. No longer just sending JSON updates that the client has to rerun. And it also doesn't need to be hydrated the same way that traditional React components do. So I wanna draw a pretty clear line here between what a server component is and things that we use with them that aren't necessarily server components themselves. So usually when people are talking about RSCs, they're kind of including these other things in them, like server actions for updating server component contents on client. They're also usually talking about routing for server, what do I want to call this? I'll just say routing, honestly, because most people associate some type of routing with server components, which honestly makes sense because traditionally with a single page app, the actual route you're on doesn't matter to the server. The server just sends some empty HTML and a JavaScript blob that determines what gets run. And then the client side looks at the URL and renders the right page based on what the URL is. In order for server components to render different content for different routes, now the server components have to be aware of routes, which means you need some type of router in order to use server components fully for a proper website. That said, these things are not server components. These are things that we are building, thinking about, and working on outside of server components in order to complete the model. And I want to draw a distinction between server components and the server component model, because these get grouped together as one thing, and they're not. I know you are going to be complaining, saying you're being super pedantic about this, but I think it's really important to understand the difference here, because server components themselves, as this little box here, not including the rest, these are pretty damn close to stable. They might not be in the stable React release yet because they're trying to smooth out all the edges and make it as close to perfect as possible. But the developer experience here, the syntax, the APIs, almost everything that matters around server component experience has been done for quite a bit of time. And we go to the tweet that led to me doing this today. I've had this video on my to-do for a while, but after I saw this Ryan tweet today, I realized I had to do it sooner than later. As he says here, RSC is farther from production ready than he thought, time to get back to work on current Remix APIs. He's excited about RSCs. It gives him a clearer vision of migration paths. They're still going to do it. They were just expecting it to be their next API iteration to be based on it. Going to let others be the canaries dying in the mines and we'll do a quick iteration on Remix without it. And Lee responds here, gets ratioed pretty hard. Because again, that's why we have a different definition. You said it best yourself. If production ready means customers are using it in production, and there's about 8,000 of the top 1 million sites on the web using React server components right now. I, I like this tweet a lot. I think people are stressing too much about RSC implementation details. PHP echo example. The majority of devs understand what makes that work when a request comes in. Just dump a file in a public HTML and it works. If next remix are successful, you won't notice RSCs. And he says here, you don't notice Rails, you won't notice RSC. And that's really how it should get to. And I'm increasingly excited for us to get there.
They had a little back and forth, as Ryan said, put it in a stable React release. And here's somebody saying, you're still ignoring action responses outside of client components. App router stability from server actions. And here's the other problem. So once again, let's separate this into three parts. Three layers of depth to this. Depth level one, RSC is this much. App router is this much. And the new React model is this much. So yes, depending on, and this is what's so annoying to me, is people talk about all three of these like they're the same thing, but they're different combinations of these pieces. The server components exclusively run on server. To take strong advantage of them, you need routing, but to have a great experience with all of the parts, we also need server actions too. It doesn't mean these other parts aren't valuable by themselves. In fact, the app router, even if you use client components everywhere, is still a better experience than the pages router. And server components, even if you don't have routing, have a lot of potential as a part of your build process to have better templates for your HTML before you send that to the user initially. There are benefits to all of these pieces without them all being together, but the amount of them that you're combining is what determines the term we use on the left here. And I can say outright, server components are really stable. App router is pretty stable. The new React model and specifically server actions, we got some work to do there. You can swap out any of these pieces. Like instead of using app router for routing, you can use Astro. I don't know how far along that story is, but it works. Instead of using server actions for your relationship between the server and client, post load, you can use tRPC, which is what we've been doing a lot at Ping. You don't have to adopt the whole model to get benefits from it. And while yes, the bottom chunk here is not super stable, the top parts here are super stable. This part at least it feels incredibly stable. Almost nothing has changed in the server component model since it was initially proposed. And app router has made a ton of progress to the point where I don't really have issues with it. It's really good. There are problems that exist outside of its stability, like the developer experience being slower than other frameworks and even than pages router used to be. But that doesn't mean it's unstable. It means that it has rough edges to smooth out. And thankfully, none of those rough edges hurt users. They hurt our experience as devs, and they're all being worked on really actively. I see people linking this SAM thread. Let me check that quick. In DHH's latest keynote, he says even React is coming back around to the benefits of sending HTML to the browser rather than JSON with the advent of server components. Common misconception. RSC actually can't render HTML. I know how to best communicate the RSC architecture in clear This is actually something I think I agreed with Ryan on with that quote tweet here. I think what Sam's discussing here is this problem. Like the majority of devs don't understand how the PHP file works. I don't think they have to. I don't think devs need to understand that they're not actually sending HTML to the client. I think it's a really powerful metaphor for how it works. And that's why I am not sure I fully agree with Sam here. There are interesting, powerful intricacies that he's touching on here but I don't think it's as important as he's pushing. I don't even know if this should go in the video. Yeah, I don't think this level of detail is super important. I don't agree with him that it's the onus is on React. I think we're just as valuable as like spokespeople for this and deeply invested developers who understand how the model works. I think it's up to us to make it as digestible as possible. These trees can be pre-rendered into HTML. The thing that's hugely different though, is that the pre-rendered HTML can come after the first byte and it doesn't have to be sent as the JavaScript as well. I think that's the part he's missing here. Like, how do I, okay, never mind. This does go in the video. Here is old SSR. Far as this request, it runs GSSP. It runs React code to generate HTML for route. It sends HTML to user. User fetches JS. This is the important part. Same JS from SSR runs on client to hydrate. Page now works. So this piece here, this is massive. While yes, we did run the JavaScript on the server once to generate the HTML, that exact same JavaScript has to run on the client. And while get server side props let us embed a minimal amount of like the data that is needed by that stuff. If one of these components does a fetch, it has to fetch on the server and on the client in order to hydrate properly. If one of these GSSP things is different on the client than it is on the server, everything's going to break. If you're running this code in a different time zone on the server than on the client, it's going to break. We are running the React code on the server once, but it, and it is sending the HTML to this client once. But despite that, it's not actually running. 
wording this is hard. And this is the problem here is that I wouldn't consider this React sending HTML. I would consider this running React on the server as a starting point for React to pick up on when it hits the client. The new model is very different because it doesn't have to run get server side props. Once it's part of the request, it has to create the React tree. And when it creates that React tree, it's going to mount the top node. It's going to see what that mounts and it's going to go down and render everything. If it hits a suspense boundary, respond with all non suspense components. This is step three. As soon as we've created the React tree, if there's any async components, do what they need to. If any of them are in suspense, we don't have to wait and block on that. So we send a response. When things update on the client, when stuff has changed, or in this case, when the suspense stuff comes through, stream in additional HTML from suspended components. So this is the big difference is once you've hit this line, the server code has stopped running in the old model. And this server is no longer sending HTML to the client. It is now sending props or API calls. And then the rest all runs on the client, gets JSON and runs the React code there. With the new model, this whole thing runs on the server and sends HTML to the client until you specify that you don't want that. In fact, you can actually pass a server component to a client component. This is where things get really fun. So in this example, I block the page until this file is read. Let's pretend that this takes longer to read. Async function get file contents. I'll return this here. More importantly, I'm going to sleep for a thousand. I'll do 2000. So it's more exaggerated. Const file content equals await get file contents. Cool. This is pretty standard stuff. My function home gets file content, which is reading from the file system, and then it renders that. It's just a, a number that I have saved in there for now. So if I bun run dev this current count 23. Cool. So this is the count rendering from there. You'll notice that if I command shift R network tab it disable cache, this is going to take two seconds to run because I have that blocking call. So in the old React server-side rendering model, you'd either have to do this or you'd have to expose this as an API so the client could render it. There was no world before where doing this call wouldn't either block the entire page from sending any HTML or have to go in to an API endpoint that then sends JSON that the client then renders. That world did not exist. With the new model, that world doesn't just exist, it's become the default. So if I want to send other content while this is waiting, I'll do async function count component. I will yoink this, we'll return div with the current count instead. And now I'll just put hello here as the default and we'll add the count component. This is no longer async, so we can delete that. This doesn't change anything yet, but this is where again, the new model becomes so powerful. If we add a suspense wrapper here now, this is going to pop in once it's done. Fallback goes here. And now when I refresh this, it's going to say loading until it's done. If I put this in a div, it will behave exactly the same. Ta-da. Really dope that that's that convenient. And if you look at the network tab while this happens, you'll see the additional content is actually coming in through this first request because it's streamed in as part of that first request. We get additional data as part of the HTML embedded over time. And yes, it does have some JavaScript that runs to put that HTML in the right place, but it is serialized HTML that it is effectively sending to the client after the fact. And the important part here is that the JavaScript this needs to run isn't there. Let's say we wanted to have multiple different components that were like various amounts of complexity. Here's a more realistic example that I just ripped from the upload thing code. We have this generate pattern file that is massive. It's like half a megabyte of just patterns that we grabbed from the hero patterns open source project because we want to render different patterns based on your app just to make it look nice in the dashboard. That's a lot of code and we don't want to send all of this code to the user. What we want to send is the HTML that represents the output of this code. So if I in here style equals get random pattern styles for file content, you'll see we have this pattern here now and it will always be the same pattern when I load the page. And if I go change the content of that file quick, let's change this to 30. I reload. The pattern's different now. None of these patterns are going to the client. What the client is getting is updated HTML that represents the contents of this. And that's why I don't think it's fair to say this isn't really HTML. Cause like, sure, the way it's serialized might not be standard HTML you render the standard way, but we're not sending JavaScript to run on the client anymore. The actual JS that runs for this component never touches the client. So this gigantic file that otherwise would have had to go to the client doesn't in this model. We just get the style 
from the function's output. That is very different. While you theoretically could kind of have done this in the past by calling that function in get server side props and then passing that data all the way down to the component that needs it, nobody does that. Nobody does that. And the few who try to end up with really unmaintainable, miserable applications, and they're still rerunning that same code on the client and the server. And God forbid you fuck up one import, now it just breaks entirely. This is the first time I've not had to worry about the size of a file because get random pattern styles this file is not something I would have put in an old model React project because this is a ton of JavaScript. And yes, it's JavaScript that has HTML inside of it, but it sucks. And now with the new model, we don't send the JavaScript. We don't send the component. We might send where the component's mounted so that it can be updated correctly. But we're not sending the component itself. We're not sending the JavaScript for this component. We are sending a structure that tells the client where the component is, but we're also just sending the HTML for it to update. Somebody said this in chat, I very much agree. It's effectively serializable React outputs. It's the thing that this returns serialized and subcomponents in it can still be client components. Like if I took this part here and I went and put this in another file that was a client component, then it would also send all of that JavaScript. So like something I can do just to, to demonstrate this is I'll export something random at the top of the file. Export const something random equals something random and unique. If I was to go through the JavaScript the client gets here, internals, here's the main app. You'll see something random does not appear in this file. But if I was to quickly make pattern bg.tsx use client, so now I have a client component that does the same thing. And if I hop in here and I return this instead, import it. Cool. Now that I've done that, the JS should no longer be cached. Something, something. Yeah, here it is. So in the page JS file for this page, something random and unique made it in. And see how much content is in here, how much shit snuck in with this seemingly innocent change. This is how React always worked before. This is why I choose to say React sends HTML now, because yes, that does gloss over some details. I don't think those details are that important. In fact, I'm actually concerned this video is going to do more damage than good because people are going to be way overthinking this now. If you effectively treat this like it sends HTML that happens to have the ability to mount client-side React components, it's much easier to understand. And it does still run these client components on the server, but it has to send all of the content on the client side too. So everything that BG div needs to render has to be both on the server and on the client. But if I just kill that, all I've done is remove the use client there. Look, do you see how much less JavaScript is in here now? Are you kidding? I put use client back here. Here's all the content. Here is what I'm sending. And if I delete this, this is what I'm sending. Do you understand the difference now? We're not sending JavaScript to the client in the same sense anymore. We're in a different world now. This is why I say we're sending HTML because it's way easier to understand the benefits that way. Sorry, I'm getting annoyed by these things, but I'm just like, I love you, Sam. I understand what you're going for. I'm excited for you to be at NextComp so we can talk about this because I don't think this is the right thing to be communicating here. And I also think this is our responsibility to figure out how to communicate because the React team talks to us, the influencers who are really nerdy about the shit. And then we figure out how to communicate it to everybody else. That's our job. And I am really excited to do that job. And I know you are too. And I hope we can work together to make this model easier to understand. The way we're communicating it now isn't misconceptions, it's simplifying the model so people can better understand how these things work. And I think it's really important that we communicate this meaningfully. So yeah, it's a cool thread. I don't agree. I think we are effectively sending HTML to the user with this new model. And it's way easier to explain it in that way. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, again, with the Excala draw, everything we did here has to be sent to the client to be done there as well. With the new model, that's not true anymore. With the new model, you send HTML and effectively like scaffolded, serialized HTML to the client initially. And when new things stream in, you send that too. And if you use the revalidate with server actions, you're sending again, serialized HTML. It keeps track of where components are, but it doesn't keep track of what the components are, just the output of the component. It's moving HTML around. One more example that might actually be helpful for people. New, boring, old, create next app project. I'm gonna do two things. First thing is I'm gonna make a.text. This is the content of a on the server. And we're gonna do b.text. B's content is a bit different. Cool. So we now have a.text and b.text. Let's grab both quick. Delete all of this. And let's render both. So const content of a equals, I'll import fs quick, content of a equals fs dot read file dot to string. I have to wrap this for that. This is async. 
Should I be doing these parallel? Yes, I'm lazy. And now let's say we have two divs, div content of A, div content of A. Content of A, this is the content of A on server. Now let's do content of B. So this is pretty simple. So we have content of A and content of B. What if we want to just show A and have a tab bar where we switch between A and B? Previously, we would have had to expose this as an API, have people fetch the JSON content for each of them and render it on the client, or we'd be encoding it in the URL and probably not caching it properly because I'll be honest, next query params have never been great. But what we can do with the new model that's so powerful, I'll make components, we'll throw in here tab.tsx. In this file, I have a use client component so this runs on the client, it gets passed to React nodes. And on the client side, we can set state to change if we want A or B selected. So now we need to use this component. So we'll hop back here. It's going to error because we don't have A or B in here yet. So we'll do A equals yoink and B equals yoink. This is where I think things get really, really cool. So when I click here, it changes the content on the client, even though the code for this doesn't run on the client. The magic of this pattern is that I'm passing here serialized HTML. If these two things needed the background code again, which I can just go grab really quick, let's grab this file and I'll paste this in here. And I will style equals generate pattern. Oh, let's get random pattern style, my bad. Content of A, and I'll do the same thing here for content of B. And now when I switch between these, they have different patterns. This is the JavaScript that gets sent to the user for this page. There's a bunch of stuff that gets compressed from Webpack. There is the license. So this is mostly just the strings for the different errors and stuff. Because this is running in dev mode, there'd be a lot less stuff in here otherwise. But most of this is just one big serialized object with all the different key values for which HTML to render in different cases. What isn't in here again, if I go here and we grab my something random and unique, it's not going to appear in this file. But what will appear in this file is the content of B. So if I actually go to b.txt again, and I search for this in here, probably going to be serialized, not going to have that. No, that's not where they put it. I actually don't know where they would have stuffed this, but it will be referenced somewhere in here. Let's figure out which file this is in. Hmm. It might just be in the HTML. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. Okay, this actually kind of makes my point. The content that is switched between these two when you click them. So when I go from A to B here, it's not even encoded in the JS file. It's encoded in the script tag at the bottom of the HTML file. So yes, it's JavaScript in the sense that it exists in the JS, but it's not JavaScript in the sense that the component isn't there. It's just the reference to which HTML gets rendered there. And if you read this, it's not the actual JavaScript. It's literally just the HTML output serialized so that it can be changed conditionally. So yes, it's not just sending the HTML that magically switches between these two things. But what it is doing that I think is much cooler is it is sending a representation of the HTML that we passed to that component. We passed it, this server component and this server component. We sent it two different HTML props and it doesn't need the JavaScript to run these on the client side. It just needs the syntax and the HTML that gets rendered at the end. It's very different. And this is what makes this model so cool is that I am running this on the server. I'm generating HTML that gets embedded into the JavaScript the client gets. And now the client can choose which set of that HTML it's rendering or using at any given time. But despite having this dynamic behavior, it's not actually sending the JavaScript for these components for the conditions and for the rendering. It's passing the HTML as a prop. So yes, it is not just HTML in the sense that there's things running on the client so it knows which HTML is where, but it's passing HTML around now, which is even cooler. This was not possible in the previous model at all. And this makes it feel so much more HTML-like because I'm effectively just passing these different HTML elements as props, but it just feels like passing components do anyways. It's dope. It's really cool. And I think calling this HTML simplifies the understanding for the vast, vast majority of people. So yeah, now that we've finished this tangent, I want to go back to the original point of the video. <laughs> which is our server components production ready. Server components themselves, absolutely. This new model is really dope and it works great. When it has problems, you run into them immediately. They don't pop up weeks, if not months later, because a user hit an edge case. You run into the problems immediately. It works really well and it's exponentially simplified so much code that I write. Even just two or three days ago, I was updating one of my routes for my image management tool to make it easier for people who weren't signed in to get access to some of the images. And it was like five lines of code to make a whole new route 
and just make an entirely different experience for my users because the backend and the front end are no longer this arbitrary split that I have to work on both sides of. It's now kind of a bar that I can move between the two as I need for my applications. And it's made so much of what I'm building so much simpler. App Router has its quirks. I don't love file-based routing still, but I see why it's so valuable, especially with these new patterns. And Server Actions as the piece to close out the new React model, they're still very early. They have a lot of gotchas, but I do think it's going to continue improving and eventually get to a point where it's great. But that doesn't mean these things aren't stable. It doesn't mean that they're not production ready. And depending on which axis you're cutting on, as well as depending on what your definition of production ready is, either all of server components model is not production ready, or most of it is very production ready, specifically the RSC part, this top piece here. It's in a great state. We've been shipping it for a while. I've had a great time with it. I think for most people, server components are totally production ready. That said, there is still a lot to be done with the new React model, and we're still working on it, learning from it, and improving it every single day. But with the new next release coming soon, with more and more people adopting these patterns, and eventually with React merging this to the React main release with 19, 20, whatever they decided to call the new version, this is going to go from a debate to reality. I think we are a little pedantic when we talk about production ready. I think we conflate a lot of different things when we talk about server components. But my experience is more than production ready. And I wouldn't hold back if you see the benefits of these tools right now. There is nothing you can adopt right now that will meaningfully change to the point where it will fall apart in the near future. All the syntax, all the behaviors, all the patterns, they're all stable. It's a matter of smoothing out the way they work together so that the next generation of developers can have a next generation experience. So that's my thoughts. Don't hold back if you're excited. Feel free to hold back if you want to wait for these things to get ironed out. Page router is still great, but app router has changed the way I built. If you want to learn more about why server components are so different or just go in depth on all these things, I have a video pinned here where I go really in depth on server components. You do seem to think you're going to like the video below that. So check that out too if you haven't. Thank you guys as always. Really appreciate y'all. Peace nerds.